up the pack. <laughs> oh man, I'm I'm excited. Why I'm am excited. I? I'm always excited. I'm you know, usually it might be, excited too. It might be the meth. It, it might, might be. be. We were just talking about that. So this is, this is Alicia Kurtz. Hi. She is a emergency physician uh, based in Sacramento, California. Mm-hmm. Sacto, the Bay Area, and back down. Kelly is with it. Put they Mac down. Give me love. California. Um, and... <laughs> Are we going to stop now? No, I was no. like so ready to. <laughs> we just got started. People are coming on in. Adam Great. Sturdivant's here. Hi. All kinds of people are coming in. Krista Thomas. What up, fam? All right. Here's the thing. <laughs> the reason Alicia's with us today is she happens to host a podcast called Real Talk and is a expert on the wellness of our frontline healthcare professionals, physicians in particular. Yes. And I was interested because, you know, this is part of our Vituity series. We want to, like, figure out ways to solve problems that all of us are suffering with. And I think she has some ideas, and it relates to sharing stories. Now, I know nothing about this because I just trust intuitively (laughs) that a fellow physician from the Central Valley who trained in Fresno, which is where I, my family lives, and I know that place, so I know you got good training because the meth, all right? Yes, all of the meth. Yeah, so all of it. How did you How did you get into like uh, wellness and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Interestingly, even though you don't know, I'm going to say this. It all started in my residency. So it was a perfect, perfect segue. Uh, So I had the incredible privilege of doing my emergency medicine residency in Fresno, California, which if you don't know a lot about the valley, like, by the way, California has all these valleys. No, no, no. The valley. Like the the actual valley of California. The great central Central valley. Valley. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, is a is an area that's historically very underserved. They just they have a lot of um, migrant families, a lot of indigent families, a lot of people with no insurance, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on, and mm. so I trained at this giant monstrosity of a hospital and an ER uh, called Community Regional Medical Center. Old school docs would call it UMC, but it changed before I ever got there. Uh, and it's a hard place to work. I mean, it's constant. They have a hundred and something beds in the ER alone. Um, the acuity rate is very high. We're really busy. You see everything. And then at some point during my like third year, I noticed that the culture in our residency, while everyone was awesome, was really suffering, just really struggling. Um, because it's a hard place to work and you see a lot of really terrible things. There's a lot of really violent gang stuff that goes on. There's a lot of really sad cases of patients that didn't otherwise have care or access to care and they come in and you're diagnosing cancer in somebody who just thought they had belly pain for five years. Can, can, can I interject? Yeah. So, so I, tr- I did my uh, fourth, thir- third and fourth year like surgery and ER rotations in that nice. hospital b- before it became CRMC. Yeah. And those were some of the most memorable cases mm-hmm. because it was like young gang related mm-hmm. violence shot, died on the table, yeah. like my hands on his aorta, like crazy stuff, like you're saying, Absolutely. and a new diagnosis of cancer. All that is, she's not making this up. And right. you guys who work in these kind of scenarios understand what this is about. And the thing is, there's no processing for this. So you just are like, take a couple suck it ups and call me, don't call me in the morning. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And the key being that, you deal with one of these cases, it's very tragic, pediatric or a young person, et cetera. And then you have this list of, I mean, the lobby is always full of patients just waiting to be seen. And so there is never really a good beat. There's no time to just stop and say, how did that make me feel? Or that was really messed up. Um, Or that was way more powerful than the things I see on TV, which are not always real, they're scripted, but this was real life. This is a real family. That was a real person I had to just tell, I'm sorry, your son was in the wrong place at the wrong time and got caught in the crossfire of a literal gang fight and he's dead now. And we didn't have space for that. And Natalie Rachel says, no time to debrief, move along to the next one. Exactly Exactly true, Mm -hmm. exactly true. And that's definitely true everywhere, but extra in Fresno. Mm -hmm. Um, And so my co-chief residents and I, big shout out to Jeremy and Steve. I doubt they're listening because they both have new babies, but still shout out to them. The three of us had this idea because we're sort of obsessed with these storytelling podcasts like The Moth. The Moth, any, yeah. any NPR nerd friends out there? I know you're out there. All the doctors listen to NPR. I'm Terry Gross <laughs> with Fresh Air. That's right. That's right. W-H-Y-Y yes. in Philadelphia. Nina Totenberg. Whatever. Yeah, love these people. Ira Glass is my spirit animal. Yeah, he is awesome. Uh, he is. Yeah. And so I had this idea that was like, why do we not do this in healthcare? Why do we not stop... And not tell our fun, like, cocktail stories. I'm sorry you found a Buzz Lightyear where in that guy. Like, we all talk about that stuff. But why don't we stop and talk about the things that are really hard? 
or powerful or meaningful or thrilling or just devastating. Um, and instead, we kind of kept catering to this like iron dock mentality. There, there's a pride that comes with not being phased by things, right? Like you're proud of yourself when you make it through three pediatric codes in one day without being phased, but you are phased. Like the reality is that on the inside, you're really not okay. Like nobody normal <laughs> would be okay with that. And so we started this program mm. that we call Real Talk, um, where we started with our residency. So it was a senior resident, although now the model is any provider, can share a story in front of a room of their peers about anything that has affected them personally in their time working in healthcare. This could be a particular case that was meaningful for you or that went badly or that went really well. It could be um, a specific patient that stands out to you for a reason. It could be like, I had a baby or I got married or I got divorced or my mom died or something that happened while you were working in healthcare. For us, it was during residency, but it applies uh, after residency too. And you share that story in something between seven and maybe 15 minutes. There are no slides there's no point at the end. There's no, this is my takeaway for you. It's just your story and why you're telling it. So maybe it's, you know, um, we, I've heard a story before where it was like, my mom died of breast cancer. And so whenever I see patients in the ER who have cancer, I really sit down and I pause and I say, do you know what these drugs are? Do you understand the side effects? Have you thought about chemo? Do you know how far along your, your disease processes, all the things they had wished someone had done for them when their mm. mom was struggling with that. So for them, the story was about how cancer patients are really special to them. Mm. And it turns out that everybody has a story, right? So at the end of this one person sharing theirs, we put up one or two discussion questions that pull out the theme of that story and gives everyone in the room a chance to share in small groups that facilitates conversation that your team would otherwise never have had. Mm. Right. When am I going to stop and be like, hey, Z, I want to talk to you about this like really deeply emotional thing that happened to me on shift because I would love to process it. And I think it would help us understand each other better and work better together on shift. Like we don't do that. That's not classically no, how it, you're it, trained. In fact, that's grounds for a psych consult. <laughs> like yeah. if, if someone does that, you're just right. like, wait, what? You know, because I'll never I mean, and these comments are amazing too. So when uh, Janet says when my first patient died, I went to break room and cried and an experienced nurse came in and got after me mm -hmm. as an experienced Experienced nurse now, I hope I never get that way. And and this is the thing. I, so the, my experience with this was, you know, as I became a more jaded attending and started to get, you know, uh, the moral injury that comes with years of working in a major facility. The students would come to me and say, you know, that 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 last case really affected me for whatever reason. And it took that. Like the student coming to me yes. and going, this is my experience with this. And it was hard. How do you deal with it? And I'm like, yeah. how do I deal? What? Deal with what? <laughs> I've built a right. wall so thick around myself. Yes. I can't feel anything. Yes. But if you really ask me, if you put me in psychotherapy or put me on some kind of drug, it will all come out in a exactly. torrent. So, so, so this, so to, did you set this up then in residency? Right. Yeah. So we, so it started in my residency as a formal part of the conference curriculum. This part, I think I, I will never stop being so proud of the fact that mm. Fresno, the administration stood behind us and like let us just do this. So instead of having our wellness lectures, the wellness part of our mandatory conferences be like, hey guys, you should sleep more and eat vegetables, even though there's not a single one in the hospital. Uh, like instead of that, they let us do this instead. Mm. So every one of our senior residents had to give one of their stories as part of the mandatory conference curriculum. I'll tell you that the room was slammed. Like every month there were almost every resident was there. Even the overnight people would stay and sleep in their yeah. car and come in. It got goosebumps. No, yeah, like no one wants to miss this, right? Like no one wants to miss this part. And then what we saw in the end was that the culture amongst our friends blossomed. I mean, it was, there were these two, my favorite part, there's these two guys. One was my classmate. One was a little bit behind us. They did not get along. Very strong personalities. And I've so, never seen that happen. No, not in, in medicine. residency for mm, medicine. No, 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 we all get along great. Yeah, yeah. every yeah. single male in residency gets along with all Weak, the other males. Total sieve. <laughs> like I'm a wall. She's a sieve. <laughs> totally true. Um, but yeah, so these two guys really didn't get along. And so naturally, when we were making these small groups, we forced them to be together. And so after a couple of months of doing this, one of them came to me and said, uh, listen, I'm never going to like that guy. Like, I'm never going to like that guy. But I find myself being so much less irritated with him on shift because I actually understand him now. Uh, I know who he is. I know where he came from. We're never going to be friends, but I don't just feel this like, go away thing deep inside me anymore. 
Um, so what we found is that it facilitated conversations that we'd never had. It made it normal to have them on shift. So we would stop, you know, if you had a really bad case, it was now normal for the senior resident to say, hey, middle resident, we just had a bad case. Can you go cover the zone for a minute? I just need like five minutes. And you would take the other resident who ran that case and say, do you want to talk? Do you want to go outside? There was one day when one of my attendings said to me, that was, he came in for the morning shift right as I finished a horrible, horrible case at the end of my overnight. And he said, everybody else covered the zone. Alicia and I are going for a walk. And we just went out in the parking lot and we walked around for like 10 minutes and we just talked about it. And no one had ever done that before. This like, is like a foreign yes. country you're talking <laughs> yes, about. exactly. I, the culture of medicine does not admit no. this kind of behavior. No, it's Alicia. not allowed. It's, it's not literally al- not allowed. It's not only not allowed, it's it's an existential threat to the mm-hmm. wall that we build around ourselves. Right. And so the question I have for you is, mm-hmm. it, did you find resistance actually? Because I'll tell you, there's ego defense around not letting people see that you're a human being. Oh, what if the patients find out that we're actually upset? Well, they're going to stop coming to CRMC and, you know, right. they're going to go to the other ER. They have no choice. Right. <laughs> you know, and also, I'm taller. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but yeah. So, I mean, how did... Sure. Yeah. What I will tell you is that I have learned something beautiful about humanity. And that is that if you, as an administrator, as a leader make space for something like this, which speaks to the fact that you actually value it. You're not just saying you do, but you actually do because you created space for it. If you do that, people will share. Mm. They will watch each other. It will be a few people the first month, a few more the next month, and by the fourth or fifth month. we Okay, so to jump ahead a little bit, when I ended, entered Vituity, I got very fortunate that some of the leadership, this program we had was featured on MRAP, another very popular emergency medicine pack, podcast. My people, my people. Yeah, they're really great. Yeah. Um, they featured us as just a piece of like, hey, you could do this in your program. And one of the leaders at Vituity, Greg Miller, heard it. And pull, I was a brand new, like just signed on partner. And he pulled me aside and said, hi, I'm the CMO. Do you think attendings could benefit from this thing I heard you're doing on MRAP? And I said, yes, everyone <laughs> would benefit from doing this. And so he said, let's do this at our sites in Vituity. Let's teach our normal ER sites, like our actual attending physician groups to do this together. And so now we host in-person sessions. We, we train different sites to do this. We do it at regional conferences or at big national conferences. You can do this literally anywhere. All you need is a storyteller and a bunch of people willing to break into small groups and talk to each other. We've done it as grand rounds with like doctors and nurses and techs all in the same room from the whole hospital. We've done it for just one department of the hospital. We've done it for like medical staff groups. We've done it for just the local ER partner group. It translates to any specific group of people that work together. And so then um, what we've seen there is like there was a guy. So Marco, Marco, wave, come over here. This is the producer of the podcast version. Hi, Marco. Um, Marco stands in the back, obviously, like listening to the sound and how everything is going. uh, Because on our podcast now, everything's recorded live. And Marco was in the back and there was this guy, I will not name, because I'm sure someday he'll see this. But he was standing next to Marco and he was like standing there. And I gave an intro and I said something like, you know, when we talk about physician wellness, raise your hand if you roll your eyes. And everyone raises their hand because I also am so sick of talking about it. Like, show me the money. Let's change it. Stop telling me to sleep more, right? And this guy leans over to Marco and he's like, I'm rolling my eyes right now. And he starts kind of sh- like giving this, he's like laying shade <laughs> about my program. Throwing shade at you? That's awesome. <laughs> Marco. And he's like, to, but then the storyteller happened to be a friend of this guy's. And that storyteller, who was one of the episodes on the podcast, was talking about how he's now a, a leader in emergency medicine. He and his wife had a hard time getting pregnant. And he, they got a lot of bad news. They mm. went to the ER. They went to the hospital. They, they had a lot of bad news along mm. the way. Mm. And he's talking about taking care of a woman who was similar age to him, who was like, for those of you who are medical, she's a G5P0, right? So mm. she's tried and tried and tried. And he has to be the one to tell her that she had a miscarriage. And while for a lot of us, like if I'm being honest, for me, I feel bad for those people, but I kind of just roll with the punches. For him, it was very different. It was way more impactful. And so he's telling this story, which ends happily, don't worry. Um, But it, it was beautiful. And this guy who was like throwing shade over here, by the end of the story, he starts kind of leaning in on the back of a chair. Then he turns the chair around and he's kneeling on it. Then he turns it back around and he sits down and he's like leaning forward listening. Then he finds himself in a small group and he's like sharing his own story. So 
even the skeptics, once their friends do it or once someone they admire do it, like everyone sees how powerful. That I, is. you know, I'm sitting here absorbing this and just like just going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is this is the whole. So okay, so so many things here. I, the, the one thing I want to say is like that's the whole purpose of my platform, right? Is communal. Mm-hmm. I call it communalization of our pain. Exactly. Like going, oh, this is, we're having this pain. Let's understand that we all have our own and let's share. And you can see in the comments now, people are sharing their pain, and that validation is conscious creatures we really want someone to witness yeah. that suffering and our culture of medicine is no no one sees this right. not even the person suffering so you develop these layers of, of, of um, uh, denial and compensation and and then one day you go to a rave and you do ecstasy or something right. and you tell a perfect stranger that you you cry yourself you know to sleep after your onk rotation whatever it is right and it almost takes like a truth serum to get it out yeah. to beat it out of you exactly. why should we do that to ourselves when we have the the capacity and what you said about administrators they're always telling us stuff like yeah. you should be more mindful yes. <laughs> and get a massage and yeah. you know what maybe make sure to take your vacation right. we take your wellness so seriously that we reserved parking for that, you that's right thank that's you right thank you so yeah. much how, how about thank you how about this <laughs> Set up something like what what yeah. you're doing, right? And here, here's the thing. Well, how do you monetize a uh, a storytelling session? Yeah. Because you know, I'll tell you how. Your doctors don't quit. Shazam! They don't burn out. Number they one, stay. they love working there. They're happy. They do better patient care. And number two, they stay human beings, which is what you. I thought the idea is. We do well financially when we do good for our patients. How can we do good for our patients if we're robots under yeah. 30 layers of denial and we're you know, denying mm-hmm. this thing hurts? So and this is another funny thing. So you're with Vituity. Yeah. So far, we've highlighted like, I don't know, three of your docs. Yeah. And every single one is doing something interesting. Mm-hmm. These are the kind of stories we want to bring via the show. It's fantastic. Now, here's the question. So how's the podcast? Have you gotten a lot of feedback on right. it? Real talk. Yes. So... The podcast, ultimately, we were doing these sessions live, and people kept saying, where do I hear the rest of these? And I was like, well, what, what do you mean, the rest of these? <laughs> They're like, you can't just be, you know, listening to these and not doing anything with them. Where's the book? Or like, where's the movie? And I was like, mm. oh, I don't know. Mm. So we decided to start this podcast. So when we go to these live sessions, mm. we record them now, and we get people's permission. They send their life away, and they give me their firstborn child and all that stuff. And then I take their story, and we put it in a podcast. So... Um, if you want to listen to it, it's not hard to find, like name your, your platform of choice for podcasting, including YouTube. You can find it there. Just look for Real Talk. Do yourself a favor and add Alicia Kurtz, A-L-I-C-I-A, last name K as in koala, U-R-T-Z as in zebra. Like Colonel Kurtz from Heart of Darkness. Yeah, pretty much. Really so- good guy. <laughs> good friend of mine. Uh, yeah. Highly recommend. Everyone loves him. Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> Hero of that book, so, I think, was the I, th- <laughs> I think, anyway. I think before we wrap the formal show and go to the comments, I think we should have a call to action. I think the call to action yeah. is, yeah, definitely check out the podcast. Definitely check this stuff out. But how about starting something like this in your group, no matter what you do? Let's say you're a respiratory therapist. How about... You Mm -hmm. go and start a group for respiratory therapists because you guys see some crazy ish. And, you know, you can, are you willing to like share best practices? Absolutely. So I have, I have a document that I use that anybody who's interested, you want to do this at your place, email me. So you can get me at my first name, dot last name, but the easier way, realtalk at vituity.com. So there you go. What there a it is. shameless yeah. plug. It's for so that. shameless. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I, Real talk at vituity.com. Send me an email. I'm super happy. I love the thanks for the RT shout out. Go yeah. respiratory therapist. That's right. <laughs> I know. They're the most misunderstood people on the it's planet. It's true. Um, but Next really, to the let, lab tech. Yeah. Let us know. Let us get you some info so you can start this at your site. Let me talk to your medical staff officer, your administrators. I'm very convincing. Listen, let me talk to them. <laughs> the thing about introverts is <laughs> they... Uh, <laughs> They shall yes, rule the world. They shall. It, you know, it's almost... We're, it's, we're in so much trouble. It's almost <laughs> never. It's almost never that I've done a show where the guest has just been like, Shazam! And I'm just like, I'm going to chill. I'm going to chill. The only exception is Denise Brown yeah. who's like sitting right here. Denise Brown's we did my other rounds spirit with. That's animal. Right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so, all right, guys. So, hit share, hit like. Now yes. we're going to go to the comments. What do we got, uh, Lady Denise? Mm. Yeah, there's so a lot here. Danny so Coach. Good. I've dealt with so much after being an RN for 30 years. I was hit hard with reality this week. Got a bad diagnosis that spun my world around. See, and so, Danny, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope you're going to be okay. But I would say this. Like, who do you talk to when 
you worry that your own colleagues are going to be a-holes because mm -hmm. they're so shut down, right? Whereas if you have this culture of openness and acceptance and, oh, we talk about our, our baggage instead of letting it fester, that's so much more conducive to, you know, being healthy and healing, yeah. right? One of the things we say about Real Talk is that it, it gives power back to being vulnerable. I think people, like you were Some talking- Brene Brown level-ish yeah, right there. Yeah, but you, you were talking about how um, we don't show our patients. I do. I cry with my patients mm. when their kids are dead, when they're whatever. I cry. I sit there Weak. and hold their hand. No, Not and I strong. cry. And what I, say, what I say is, I'm sorry I couldn't have fixed this. Mm. And I, my heart is broken mm. for you. And then I just sit there. And sometimes I cry or I don't. If they want a hug, I hug mm. them. I just sit. So beautiful, man. I, it, but it's different, right? It is and different. And honestly, like, I feel better. I feel like I'm not a jerk that was like, sorry, uh, the chaplain will be in in a minute. Uh, let us know if you need anything. Did you, did you, you so, know? This, so there was recently, you know, relating to this, there's recently an article about Epic by uh, a young physician who runs another podcast. Yeah. Uh, and she was basically saying the very language used by the interface right. uh, in Epic. Mm -hmm. And forget, just substitute any EHR. Let's not pick on Epic, although I hate them. Um, we hate them all the same. We hate them all the same, hate, equally, yeah. Uh, do, you know, do, you know what, do you know why I hate EHR people? Mm -mm. I actually love the people. I love the people. I hate the leadership, and I'll tell you why. Because they treat us, frontline caregivers, like we're some kind of Luddites that just don't, if we just got with the program and learned to click the boxes, yeah. everything would be okay. It's like, you know what? I used to program in assembly language in the 80s while you were still like wiping your butt with like, you know, <laughs> diaper wipes. Like, don't tell me I'm a Luddite. I'm I telling you, using diaper wipes I recognize 80s. a good... <laughs> I recognize I'm old, son. I recognize a good interface, and yeah. the, and the thing is, so this kind of this being being with our patients, being vulnerable, showing them vulnerability. It starts with even our language of medicine is yeah. so detached mm -hmm. from humanity that maybe we should think about the interface we yeah. present and are presented with. Absolutely. Um, let's see here. Oh, you got one? Yeah. Here, come on, just tell it into the mic, girl. This is Denise. What's up, my what people? Up, Denise Brown? You remember her from such uh, hits as Liver Rounds? Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so Rowan Keating, I, I think. Has a really good one it's how do you cope with the pure apathy of those around you because i think mm. that's really what we're talking about is apathy as a coping mechanism yeah and it's really an ineffective one so mm -hmm. tell us what you think about that there's nothing ineffective about apathy okay it's very effective i find it to be highly in, an engaging way of doing nothing yeah no no what are your what are your thoughts so i've yelled about this recently interesting interesting i think there is actually a time and a place for apathy i do Hmm. I think that everybody goes through their own journey. With ha like our job is really hard. I've, hmm. I've heard you talk about moral injury before. I've heard lots of. It's really hard um, to take all of that in all the time. And I think it's okay sometimes for us to need to be in a space where we just don't have feelings. I think prolonged apathy is not good for anyone. Hmm. I think it's destructive for the individual and for everybody around you. Hmm. But I do, I do want to give just a small pause that like. I have days where I just can't even anymore. Mm. And if I let myself feel, I might have an actual emotional breakdown mm. in the middle of the ER. And so I just kind of have to be a little rougher around the edges. And that's just how I'm going to get through it. And that's okay. But I think, you know, big picture, it's not a good solution. Uh, yeah. You, you want to hear a secret because no one's watching? Uh, <laughs> no except one. for 250 people. Uh, you, do you feel it, by the way? Do you yeah, ever yeah. feel it? I don't feel it. I feel apathy? like I'm just talking. No, 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 oh. not apathy. Oh, I feel like I can't. It's a, can you feel apathy or is that an oxymoron? It's oh, more yeah, like you're just apathetic. You're it's being. Very meta. I, no, it's very meta. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I never, when I'm talking to my, my Z pack, here, yeah. I don't feel like, I feel like I'm talking to a couple people. You don't yeah. realize there's a big audience there. No, in which I thought case, there was like four. Right. That's what it feels <laughs> like. And so you, you, you know, you tend to be a little more open than right. you might normally be. So I'm going to be open right now Do just it. because I think you're the only one here. So today, so you're talking about like when you have to be apathetic and, and, yeah. and kind of put on the brakes, right? Yeah. So you don't want to lose it in front of X, Y, and Z, but it's okay to lose it in X, Y, and Z. So, you know, the end of Moana have you yes, seen Moana? I love that movie. It's beautiful. It's nice to see Disney movies that aren't about teenagers getting married. 
It's so great. Yep. So there was great. no love interest no. in that movie. It's about friendship yep. and overcoming loss. Loyalty. And learning who you are. It's beautiful. Finding your tribe. Show your kids that movie, people. Moana. Mm-hmm. That's a family one. One of our biggest hits was uh, You're Welcome about nurses. You know, what can I say except <laughs> you're welcome for the ice chips, the meds, the food. Hey, hey, I'm CEO, CEO. You're welcome because these jacked up staff and Rachel's got to go. It's so dumb. Uh, so I love it. I need it, to go it watch is. that one. It is. Now, what was I telling a story about? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Vulnerability. Vulnerability. Yeah. So, so end of that movie is a scene where the, the, the bad guy spirit mm-hmm. uh, is this flaming volcano of anger and hate. And Maui's yeah. fighting him, going right on. Oh, he's a CFO. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> I actually love our CFO, just to be uh, very clear. I was just being adorable. He's, he's, <laughs> he's counting the beans, man. Yeah. So he's a flaming. Yeah, Maui. Man, Maui. Yeah. <laughs> Maui is deeply hurt inside. I'm sorry. Yeah, he's, he was abandoned as a child. <laughs> so this flaming demon, and then and then she realizes, oh, she realizes who this thing is, and to disarm this, she walks the ocean parts, and she walks through in the music, and she's singing. She's like, I see you. You, this is not who you are. You know, you're wrapped up in the, you're lost in the sauce, mm-hmm. woman, and this beautiful denouement, and. I always am like, I can't feel this right now because my kids are not allowed to see me cry. So I'm like, mm-hmm, look at this. This is a dumb ending. It's a dumb ass ending right here. And so today I got, I just signed up for Disney Plus, right? Because nice. my, my, my supporters were like, you got to get Disney Plus, son. It's $5.99. I'm like, that sounds dumb. Then I looked at what you get. All the Star Wars, yeah. all the Avengers, oh, yeah. all the Pixar, 4K. I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh, <laughs> uh-huh. So, so it's worth. I signed yeah. up for it. And I'm sitting at home. The kids are gone. I'm I'm like supposed to do this thing today. So I'm like, I'm going to watch some, oh, Moana's in 4K. I'm going to watch that ending. And I was like, I'm going to let myself feel this properly. Oh, my God. I was a mess. It was so awesome. I felt so much better. Mm-hmm. So this, again, gets nicely full circle to what you're doing. Yeah. I'm so happy that you did that. And I'm so happy it happened in Fresno. Yes. Which as Fresno. When I first left Fresno and when I was 18, uh, I went to Berkeley. And I wrote a song on my guitar called Fresno, Love It or Leave It. I left. Um, yeah. I left too. I, yeah, I, I yeah. Left too. I have a lot of love for the five five nine. Do not let any Fresno hate yes. be conveyed here. Nickel nick and nine. I lived. I lived there. I lived there when it was the two oh nine. You know what I'm wow. saying? And then they had to add five five nine. My yeah. parents' number changed. I was like, what? Yes. Um, you guys have seen me live cast from my parents' estate in Clovis. <laughs> Like nice. two and a half acres of ratchet orange yes. orchard with like yes. a well, and there's like no power half the time. It's great, man. <laughs> and, and Cynthia Ejogu says Clovis and Fresno is the best. That's right. And I like that you conflated them into an is because yeah. they are they're just Clovis. Oh, it's Fresno. very true. It's 100%. very true. What, what, somebody, somebody on here asked yeah, about. Yeah, come with they it. kind of a couple people asked us to finish the apathy conversation. I, I'm just really excited that I'm actually able to kind of read the comments. You're much better at it than me. I'm like so many things are popping. kind of nail. You're kind <laughs> of going to take my job. I'm going to be like I'm going to be like every like a weird middle America person that's like <laughs> they're coming to take my job. This is her. No, she's she's no. the the immigrant. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm the, I immigrated here from Sacramento. <laughs> It's Back basically down. a developing country. Full circle. Not, yeah, it's developed. <laughs> mostly now developed. But anyways, um, somebody said, so what's the cutoff for apathy and how do you deal with it? Because I mm. think what I will tell you is that if you're watching this right now, you're not the apathetic person. Like we're kind of preaching to the choir. None yeah. of you in the ZPAC who are sitting here building a community, listening to the things he has to say and letting me join you like this. This is not the group that's apathetic and given up. Okay. Um Obviously, in case you can't tell, I'm an extremely candid individual. Like, I don't have a filter. I literally think everything I feel is like right here. Can I do some frontal All release? The- <laughs> <sign this? laughs> All See if the she time. Start snouting. All yeah. the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> anyways so didn't mean to interrupt suckling, yeah, so, yeah exactly um, let's go through all of them now yeah, okay, let's, so do, <laughs> let's read more of them. <laughs> anyways so this all started this is like you know bear your soul moment because it feels like it's just the four of us in this room but uh so there was a time when i right at fresno we mentioned it's a huge trauma center super crazy and there was a guy there with a beautiful tattoo i didn't know anything about tattoos till i moved to the central valley and now mm. i know 
everything about tattoos. That's like a thing. And he had this gorgeous sleeve. I mean, like this thing was probably $2,000. All, all said and done. I now know about prices of tattoos also. Really expensive, intricate, beautiful, some 3D work. Like really this person spent a lot of time and their hard-earned money. It's like a, a hard-working American person. Um, did some substances uh, and then thought the best way to get back into their house was to punch their arm through a wall or through the door that had the glass panel and cut up all their arm. So they come in real intoxicated, covered in glass, whatever. One of their substances of choice is heroin. So initially like real sleepy, kind of waking up was sort of not very nice in the middle and then turns out fine. And I overhear what the nurses are saying, which isn't very nice. Mm. Um, general phrasing. Uh, that's not very nice. And so I was just like trying to talk to this guy and he's getting agitated and he's like on edge and he's just like, blah, 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 you mother effing this and bad words and blah, blah. And, and the nurses are like, sir, if you don't, no, no, right? Like everyone's kind of doing verbal escalation, which is like they just kind of one over the other. And finally, I just yelled out like, hey, my brother does effing heroin. And the room was like, and everyone kind of looks around and I was like, listen to me. And I pointed at the patient. I was like, my little brother does heroin. I am not judging you for being drunk or for doing drugs or whatever. I just need you to calm down so I can fix that gorgeous tattoo. That's it. And he calmed down, obviously, because like that was such an awesome thing. To, I'm just kidding. No, but he calmed down. Um, he lays down. I tell the nurses, like, can you? No, I said the F word. Somebody asked. No, I said it. In real life in Fresno, we, we say the F word sometimes. It's okay. Um, and with that patient, it actually helps because it made me so normal, right? Like I'm not up here because I'm a doctor. I came from the same place as every one of my patients did. I was not from like a wealthy background, none of that stuff. And so I think he got that clearly. And then over time, like I sat there and I sewed probably for like two hours. Things residents can do that attendings can't, right? Like I spent mm. two hours fixing this sleeve and I could have been sloppy I wasn't because it was beautiful and I just thought about like how much time and energy and thought and love went into this tattoo and I spent two hours with this guy and by the time we're done he's actually like awake now and talking and saying I'm really sorry like I was kind of an ass and I was like I don't know we weren't very nice to you huh? like what goes around comes around shrug right sorry and there were a couple of the nurses that were involved were these like old salty trauma nurses and this one PA that was particularly salty on the trauma service who I love. Oh, I know but, who that is. Yeah, right? I know who he that is. He works at your, your hospital too? <laughs> no, 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 no. I know him in Fresno. Oh. Hey. Yeah. Oh, you probably. The tra trauma, yeah. stop saying oh, detailed yeah, HIPAA. Yeah. No, I know who. I, I know. Ah, really anyway, salty. Yeah, really yeah. salty. And at the end of it, um, they came up to me and they were like, is that true about your brother? And they said, yes, it is. And they were like, how old is he? And at the time he was like not even 21. I'm like, oh, he's like 20, you know. Well, where is he? I'm like, I don't know. He goes in and out of like hospitals. I find mm. out when he's on a Narcan drip. Sometimes he's in jail. Mm. And then I just don't know where he is for a while. Um, and yes, it's true. And that's why like I don't say drug addict. I don't talk about, you know, you should quit, you loser. I talk about like, did you know we have a needle exchange? Like, do you, do you ever think about HIV, hepatitis? Do you know about alcohol swabs? Can I give you some? Mm. All that kind of stuff. And um, some of those nurses came back way, way, way later in my life, like a year later, and told me, I am really sorry that I ever treated people with drug abuse problems like that. Like I look at you now and I just think to myself like her brother, like this kid, this me being a kid, right? To nurses, we're all kids, the residents, but this kid comes in here, she busts her butt and she's nice to everyone and, you know, she does her best or whatever. And like her family is just like this. And like, how could I, you know, so I don't think that you can fix apathy with a magic bullet, but I think the more willing you are you, like the ZPAC community who's here supporting each other already, like the more that you're willing to stand together and not perpetuate this iron doctor, no feelings thing, and the more real you're willing to be and the less afraid you are of who you really are and where you come from, and the more you're willing to share that and be proud of it, then the people around you are going to have a much harder time being apathetic because it radiates off of you. Like mm. everyone can feel the energy when you are just such a human fully alive doing a job that you love in healthcare. Everyone can feel that. So I don't have a magic cure for apathy, but I think the best thing you can do is be the kind of person that just doesn't allow that to be around you. Mm. Wow. That was awesome. And you know what? I, now I feel like I have to outdo it um, by showing you my tattoo. It's... It's a tramp stamp. Oh my um, god! And it 
and it says too legit to quit. Um, I mean, does it really say is that? Is it faded? I don't. I don't. Oh, the ink is faded. It's light pink. It's light pink. That's why. I had them do it in a off white. <laughs> And it matched my skin perfectly. But when I get old and pale, it's going to oh, show up. Yeah. And just as I'm dying, I'm going to tell. Yes. I'm going to tell the hospice, you know, person. I'm going to be like, "Yes, roll me over <laughs> and pull down my pants." And they're going to see yeah. too legit, too legit to quit. Yeah. And you know what? I think it's in emojis. Actually, <laughs> it's the hand like this, and then like the power. <laughs> Yeah, you took it to the next level. That's really, a, that's exactly <laughs> and right. It ends with like the Hank. Ends pile, with the, yes. The oh, the little. Oh, it's... Somebody, I did see a couple of comments. No, I'm not bashing nurses. Oh, I saw guys. that too. Come on. Whoever said they were bashing no. nurses? Okay, okay, but, but yeah. let's, let's unpack that for one second. Mm -hmm. How defensive is that person that they assume that every doctor, when they talk about nurses, is bashing nurses? Yeah, it means they've been through some nurses. stuff. It means that their doctors are not nice. It means that they've not had good interactions. It means that our culture of medicine is fundamentally broken, mm -hmm. that they could take what you said and assume it was a nurse bashing yeah. thing, right? So we have to understand. And the other thing is, like, people st have stopped assuming good intent in yes. internet conversations. Yes. Like, let, you know, you, you could replace nurse with any other thank you Risa person. she's like I stood up for you oh yeah Risa thank you Risa's, Risa's like my number <laughs> number one supporter in chief man and she's in she's a nurse in uh in Utah uh nice. and uh, yeah 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 and um yeah that's right Selena they're not a supporter that's right you're not a supporter you yeah. don't know me <laughs> anyway. but I think that's it's an interesting point like I think that goes along with this stupid pride-filled thing we do in the culture of healthcare. And I don't, mm. I don't mean medicine, just I mean everyone in healthcare. All like, of it, yeah. That you can never be wrong, that you're the smartest one in the room, that you've got no room for improvement, that, that a negative thing that somebody acknowledges is immediately attacking you mm. and you've got to attack them back. Like, dude, we got to stop doing that. How, uh, how fear-based is our culture of medicine, do you think? So I'd say much. like 99.9. Start, well, for me, it's medical school. Schofield yeah. units. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? It's, Every day of your life is the most scary thing you've ever watched. I'm into. so glad you said that. It's so scary. I tell the story like I had like, like I'm not typically a sweaty, swarthy Persian yeah. man. Yes. <laughs> In medical school, I'm just deal. a swarthy Persian man. <laughs> in medical school, I had so, my pits were soaked every single oh, yeah. day for no reason, oh, yeah. and I would have PVCs, and oh, I couldn't yeah. figure. Every day was the scariest day of my life, mm -hmm. especially when we got into third year and we had to go on to rotations. Dude, I started at the county San Francisco General obst obstetrics. People still wonder I have like this weird chip on my shoulder about obstetrics, and it's because I've never been so scared in my yes, life. Agreed. And uh, and so we're so fear based. We don't want to show any weakness because they will pounce on right. it, or the perception is right. they'll pounce on it. So what you've done is you've ripped a hole with your little magical knife in the fabric of reality, <laughs> and you've let in like the actual love and understanding that the universe is actually right. made out of Absolutely. to pervade a space that has denied it exists, and I and and yet is predicated. Its entire purpose on helping relieve suffering. Absolutely. So what have we, we got to fix it? Yes, and you have to be willing to be go it alone. Like depending on where you work or where mm. you are, don't be afraid to be the first person. Like people will get used to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking I, from speaking experience. from personal experience. Hey, they will get used to you. I'll say this: they never got used to me. All right, <laughs> they just got rid of me. I'm like, yeah. I'm out. <laughs> but well, when you look back, like if you work in healthcare in any way, whether it's, you know, respiratory therapy, nurse case manager, um, you know, nurse practitioner, PA, doctor, doesn't matter, any of us, there were people who scared the bejesus out of you along the way. And everyone thought, oh, they must be a great doctor because they yell and they're tough or they're a good RT or whatever. And then when you really think about who shaped you, Mm. Who influenced you? Who made you awesome? Who, when you're falling asleep, if you close your eyes and you imagine being the exact person you want to be, like, who do you imagine? It's not those people. Mm. It's the people like my attending, Kurt Brueggemann, that came in and said, you had a rough case, let's go on a walk in the parking lot. It's mm. the people like at, at my medical school, um, Dr. Kohler, Dr. Mickelfeld, or Dr. Blair, who used to tell all of us, like, 
Think about how this affects you. Let yourself show who you are. Relate to your patient. Don't be afraid to do some small talk. Like that's allowed. You know, they want develop that relationship. You will get more from it than they will. Mm. And that never yelled at you. And then if you made a mistake, would say, how did you make that mistake? Explain it to me. How do we fix your thinking so you don't make that mistake again? It was never the people who yelled at me or who, who instilled the fear of rounds in me. Like those people are not the ones I, I don't even remember their names. Most They're fun, them. but you don't remember them. No. Yeah. Not at, I, no. I remember the community doc who was rounding the night in the CCU and pulled up the chart and was like, hey, goes to the whole nurse station. Who, who was the intern who wrote this note? And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's my patient. I don't know. That guy quit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't know. They found they found him in a, in, you know, at a tattoo parlor getting too legit to quit. <laughs> Tramp stamp. So, so, so I, I, I raised my hand. I'm like, oh, it was me. I'm sorry. What did I do wrong? Because I'm just expecting this conditioning, right? Mm-hmm. And she goes, hey, I just want to tell everybody here that, that the, the assessment and plan you wrote, which is the only part of the note that matters, was really transcendent because you said exactly what you were thinking. You explained it cohesively. You put in physiology in there. And you actually wrote about the patient's humanness in your note. Who does that? I want to call you out. And of course, everybody there is like, you're just a community attending. Shut the hell up. Like, <laughs> no one cares what you think. And I'm just sitting there going, oh my gosh, if someone said something nice <laughs> yeah. about something I care about, which right. is my ability to think clearly and communicate and this kind of thing. So yeah, it's those kind yeah. of things. Yeah. You're like, where's the part where you start yelling? I'm, I know. And I'm then ready. after that, she, she threw a scalpel at me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's how I thought that story was going to (laughs) end. Statistically speaking. Statistically, it's more likely that a scalpel ends up getting thrown. Oh, man. So, guys, should she be my permanent co-host? I don't know. Sacramento. I got to go live at the Sac Town. I mean, yeah. I'll come down to Sac Town. You should. The Bay Area and back We should get you to tell a story on our podcast. Oh, I'll tell stories. Well, no, no, no. Like like the real talk story. Oh. Like, like... Okay, I've got just two quick Fresno ones. One is one time someone literally had a Buzz Lightyear up their rectum. The X-ray had had the wings out. And everyone was like, the two infinity and beyond jokes. Like, I can't even. Non-stop. I cannot even. You cannot even. And the other one was that I had a patient who was very, very high on meth, which makes you psychotic. He ends up in the psych area. He's eventually calming down. I go in. I'm like the fifth doctor to have him. And I say, you know. You okay now? He's like, what happened to me? I'm like, it was meth, you know? Well, I have this girlfriend. She's crazy. She does this thing. And at the end, I'm like, you know what, bro? I'm going to say the B word. I'm sorry. But I was like, just no more meth and no more crazy bitches. <laughs> and I come, the nurse, like, in the psych area calls me a couple hours later and says, can you come in here? But, like, sneak in. So I sneak in the side. And she's like, look around the corner. I look around to where the patient is. He's sitting on his green. He's like, no more meth, no more crazy bitches. No more meth. No more crazy bitches. You, in, you incepted that mother effer. You were like, oh, you're like Leonardo DiCaprio. They're like, can it be done? Can inception be yes. done? He's like, highlight. I've done it. I've done it. Life no, highlight. No more meth. Forever. No more crazy bitches. Wapner. No Wapner. No Wapner. Bitches. That's unbelievable. That's so a, that is, And that is Fresno. Yeah. Love it or leave it. I'm going back. It was so Actually, Fresno. for Christmas. See my parents. It is the boomerang city. It really, it really, it really is. Works. The the yeah. gravitational well of Fresno, the event horizon is so inescapable. Yes. You're trying. You're like, I'm almost oh, at yeah. light speed. I could get out of here. <laughs> and then like McDonald's calls and is like, would you like to be the manager? And I'm like, yes, I'm back. <laughs> yeah. Now I have an excuse. <laughs> it's awesome. This yeah. was more fun than I ever Yay. could have imagined I would have with another doctor because doctors. I drank are a so beer lame. first because I was nervous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just the one though. I was at this pizza place across the street, and they were like, "Did you know happy hour just started?" And I was like, "I know now." You went to Pachi's. I, I did. They gave oh, me. A, it was beautiful. Anyway, so good. Yeah, yeah we're, we're going Pachi's back there. Is so. awesome. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> gosh! Great. Thank you all for being so nice. That was <laughs> that was. I'm and listen to the podcast. Yeah. Real talk, Alicia Real talk. Kurtz, K U R T Z. Excellent. Guys, definitely check it out. We'll put a link in there. If there's a link on iTunes, that'd be perfect. There's so many links. Thank you to Vituity, Vituity, for making this happen. And let's just show Denise back. Denise! Denise. Hello! You guys! Oh, yeah. Thanks, Deepak. We love you. Oh, we love you guys, too. Marco Polo. This is the the podcast producer, Marco. Say hi. You know, I'm going to say, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this because I'm confident in my heterosexuality. Marco is a very handsome man. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. And uh, if I, if... If I did the right thing and actually was at least bisexual, okay, 
I wouldn't have a chance. The respectable, uh, the respectable it's, thing. It's because of the it's because of the tramp stamp. It really turns <laughs> turns certain guys off. All right. <laughs> if it had a bulldog at the end, though, you'd be in. Oh, mm-hmm. Fresno, Fresno, the Fresno Fresno State <laughs> Fresno. Bulldogs. Guys, I love you. Thanks to Alicia. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. to Denise. Thanks to Marco. Thanks to God for making the universe. Oh. Okay? I don't know and why I said I'm feeling... Of 3.4. Potassium. Potassium. <laughs> <laughs> and Bye we guys. out.